Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm so pleased uh, to welcome uh, Professor Fuchs uh, today. He is going to present uh, his new book, In Defense of Human Being, published with um, Oxford University Publisher. And uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you for joining us today. <laughs> thank you, Francesca. A short introduction gives us more time. That's all, always fine. Thank you. Um, so welcome everybody uh, over there or wherever you're uh, joining our meeting. Um, I've shared the screen. Um, I'm not sure why do I have two. Um, just a moment. Before it works, appropriate. Perfect. Okay, I think it should work. Sometimes the next slides are a bit delayed, but I think it should work. So again, yes. um, it's a pleasure to present my uh, recent book uh, and some uh, sketchy overviews. Um, it's called In Defense of the Human Being and it treats foundational questions of an embodied anthropology. Uh, but despite the subtitle, I think the title needs a bit of explanation uh, because a defense uh, can be directed against a criticism, uh, against an accusation, uh, but also against a questioning or a threat. And now there is a long tradition of putting humanity itself in the dock, accusing humans of immoderateness, of greed, hubris or malice or the horrors of war as uh, currently or for the destruction of the planet also currently. However, in this book, it is not my concern to defend humanity against an accusation, but uh, uh, against a questioning. And what today is in question is what one could call the humanistic image of man. And at the center of this image is the human person as an embodied being, as a free, as a self-determining being, and as an essentially uh, social being that, who is connected with others. And according to this understanding, persons are not mere spirits or monads of consciousness, but uh, embodied living beings. And person, persons do not exist in the singular, but only in the plural, in a shared relational space. And the definitions that thus constitute a humanistic uh, image of uh, the human being culminate in the concept of human dignity, understood as the claim to recognition that a human being raises through a bodily existence and coexistence. Now, to what extent is this image of man currently in question? Beyond Freedom and Dignity, uh, that is the title of a book published already in 1971 by uh, Burroughs Frederick Skinner, an American behavioral psychologist. And Skinner argued that belief in something like free will and moral autonomy was the relic of a mythical pre-scientific view of man. And the attribution of personal responsibility and dignity, uh, so Skinner, so argues Skinner, impedes scientific progress, namely on its way to conditioning human behavior through appropriate social technology that would create a happier society. Well, uh, Skinner's behaviorist vision has failed to take hold, but his basic idea that science is capable of replacing our self-conception with a more rational knowledge of human beings and with, corresponding and with corresponding technologies is more relevant than ever. In his book, Homo Deus, the Israeli uh, historian Yuval Harari 
uh, sketched out a gloomy scenario for the future according to which scientific and techno technological progress will gradually render the liberal and humanistic view of humanity obsolete. According to Harari, we will increasingly surrender to the algorithms, data analysis, and predictions of artificial intelligence, as they can already provide better information about the future than our human intelligence. So I quote, people will no longer see themselves as autonomous beings running their lives according to their wishes, but instead will become accustomed to seeing themselves as a collection of biochemical mechanisms that is, con that is constantly monitored and guided by a network of electronic algorithms. Harari, with a constant recourse to the biological and cybernetic sciences, uh, and having thoroughly destroyed the foundations of the liberal view of man, nevertheless wants to, deal, to leave open the possibility that science could be wrong after all. So he asks, is there perhaps something in the universe that cannot be reduced to data? Are organisms really just organisms, just algorithms? And is life really just data processing? But after all, Harari's fatalistic remarks and uh, analysis, this is no more than a façon de parler. It's not really serious. And for him, ultimately, it remains the case that Homo sapiens is an obsolete algorithm. Now it is beyond doubt that the sort of view of humans that Harari describes and, uh, can have very real consequences. In China, we are currently seeing how an authoritarian regime is established, uh, is establishing a digital and artificial intelligence supported surveillance apparatus. And a social credit system records and evaluates the preferences of citizens, their political and social behavior, their conformity right down to their criminal record. Facial recognition software, uh, which evaluates public video surveillance, can easily be linked to the system. And this is where something like Skinner's social technology is now being realized, and digital dystopias are taking shape. Nevertheless, defending the human being and his freedom and dignity must not be limited to painting a gloomy picture of the future. Rather, I think it must be about criticizing the main assumptions behind a scientific view of the human being, assumptions which authors like Harari uncritically adopt. And these assumptions include in particular the following, naturalism. From the point of, of view of reductionist naturalism, there are no phenomena that elude a complete scientific explanation. Subjectivity, mind and consciousness can be traced back to physical processes. They have no independent effectiveness in the world. The biosciences regard organisms in principle as biological machines controlled by genetic programs. Selfhood, experience, or subjectivity no longer appear in this paradigm. The fact that a cat hunts a mouse can be explained as the effect of biochemical mechanisms. Taking its hunger as a basis is now considered a naive, a naive anthropomorphism. And functionalism. Phenomena of consciousness are attributed to processes of neural information processing, which transform an input into a suitable output. I come back to this. If these interlinked assumptions are correct, then humans would be far better understood in terms of neuronal processes, genetic algorithms, and digitized behavior patterns, in short, as the sum of their data. 
and hermeneutical understanding, self-reflection and self-awareness would have no value. The know thyself of the Delphic Oracle would be outdated because the Google algorithms would know us much better. And from this point of view, subjectivity, self-awareness and self-determination become mere epiphenomena, which in everyday life may still be something we believe in, but which uh, as regards reality uh, only have uh, naive, um, uh, a, real, a, a naive misunderstanding, uh, show a naive misunderstanding of ourselves. Now, a defense of the humanistic view, as I undertake it in my book, would be ill-advised if it were limited to proving that consciousness and subjectivity are irreducible. In view of the progress of neurobiology, digitalization and virtualization, a mere defense of a citadel of the subject could soon prove in ineffective, especially if subjectivity becomes more and more simulated convincingly. It is not inconceivable that the simulation of the human by artificial intelligence and the simulation of physical presence by robots could increasingly take the place of human reality. When, for example, do we begin to ascribe something like consciousness to Alexa or Siri because they express their feelings so convincingly and understand our own feelings so well? Now, this brings me to the subtitle of the volume, Embodied Anthropology. According to my thesis, the actual alternative to a naturalistic reductive image of the human being consists in the embodiment and aliveness that are constitutive of the person. Only when it can be shown that the person is present in his or her body, that he or she feels, perceives, expresses and acts with his or her whole body, can we escape the confinement in a hidden inner space of consciousness, an inaccessible citadel from which only signals penetrate to the outside, signals which can no longer be distinguished from those of an artificial intelligence. And only when persons have an embodied freedom, that means they determine themselves as organisms in decisions and actions, only then does subjectivity become more than an epiphenomenon, really effective in the world. And only as embodied physical beings are we real for each other too. There is no communication or empathy between brains, even if neuroscientists like to, like to claim that. We learn empathy only through physical contact with other persons through intercorporeality, as Merleau-Ponty has called it. And we understand others primarily, not through a theory of mind, as current psychology assumes, but already intuitively through the other's bodily expressions, gestures, and behavior. Only a few weeks after birth, babies recognize already the emotional expressions of their mothers and fathers namely by understanding and feeling these expressions with their own bodies. Theories about the inner life of others only need to be formed by autistic children who have not developed this social intuition, this social or musical sense for the resonance of intercorporeality. Now, one might object uh, that we increasingly are moving and communicating in virtual spaces where our embodiment is becoming more and more obsolete. And in the face of global digital networking, human corporeality and embodiment can increasingly appear as an atavism. And transhumanisms and transhumanists already would like to free us from our body through mind uploading. However, for one thing, the lived body 
is very much part of any virtual spaces. As every excitement while watching a movie already testifies, excitement is something embodied. But moreover, every digitally mediated online communication presupposes that we are still dealing with a living human being of flesh and blood. All online communication has as its starting or end point a concrete physical encounter. And even in a primarily virtual interaction, we always anticipate this encounter, at least as a possibility. So what my defense in this book is based on is less the classical humanism of the spirit than a humanism of the living, embodied spirit. And as such, it makes use, my book makes use of not only of, of uh, phenomenological analyses, but also of concepts of embodiment, the extended mind and inactive cognition, which have become increasingly important in, the, in recent years. The concept of embodied and inactive cognition not only allow for a critical analysis of current scientific and technological developments, but they also allow for their productive integration without falling into a backward looking cultural pessimism. So in this sense, my defense of the human being uh, can certainly be seen as a defense forward namely towards a new embodied anthropology. And even an ecological redefinition of our relationship to the earthly environment will only succeed if our corporeality and aliveness is at its center. And that means as a conviviality with our natural environment, a shared living and living is embodied. Only if we inhabit our bodies will we also be able to maintain the earth in a habitable form. The texts in my book explore this in particular in the following topics. Progress of artificial intelligence and robotics, uh, that's the first chapter, is increasingly challenging the distinction between simulation and the reality of the human being. They suggest uh, a computeromorphic understanding of human intelligence. And on the other hand, a anthropomorph an anthropomorphization of AI systems. So what distinguishes really human and artificial intelligence? Transhumanism it regards the human being in its present state of development as basically imperfect. Our goal should be to create a homo optimus or to free our mind completely from the biological body. So is there a meaningful concept of the post-human? Then the increasing speed of virtuality and the increasing spread of virtuality and digital media also tends to cancel out the difference between embodiment and simulation. So what distinguishes real and virtual encounters? Closely linked to this development is the widespread thesis of constructivism or neuroconstructivism, according to which our perception is no more than an illusory and deceptive construction of subjective realities. So how can our perception be rehabilitated as a real and intersubjective constitution of reality. That is one of the topics of, the, of a chapter. Then advances in neuroscience, in, in the neurosciences have been uh, making, uh, have, have been, uh, have appear, let, let appear the human subjectivity as an epiphenomenon of brain processes. And thus they undermine the idea of personal freedom. So are we really just creatures of our neurons? In psychiatry, such naturalistic concepts have led to a cerebrocentric view of mental illness, which doesn't do justice to the patient's experiences and relationships. 
Does mental suffering really exhaust itself in brain processes? And finally, acceleration and digitalization processes lead in Western societies to a repression of the cyclical bodily rhythms of human time in favor of the monolinear time of growth and acceleration with well-known psychological and ecological consequences, such as burnout in the individual or climate change and the dimension of the earth. And to what extent does embodied lived time resist its uh, increasing acceleration? Now, these forms and conflicts of temporality must be analyzed in order to better understand uh, the social and cultural dynamics of Western societies. These are the topics of my essays, and I hope they will achieve their goal of contributing to the defense of the human being, a defense not least against humanity's own voluntarism, because it is the crucial endeavor of modernity to transform everything given into something made as the German philosopher Gernot Böhme aptly puts it. And this endeavor has today reached a point where the constitution and freedom of the human being itself are called into question. And it will not only be a question of theoretical reason, but an ethical and ultimately a political question, whether this situation uh, whether, in, whether in this situation a humanistic view of the human being can be defended. Because as Carl Jaspers once wrote, the image of the human being that we consider to be true ultimately decides how we deal with ourselves and with others. And today we also should add with nature. Humanism in the ethical sense therefore means resistance to the rule and constraints of technocratic systems, as well as to the mechanization of humans. If we conceive ourselves as objects, as algorithms, or as neuronally determined apparatuses, then we surrender ourselves to the rule of those who seek to manipulate such apparatuses and to control them social technologically. For the power of man to make himself what he pleases means the power of some men to make other men what they please, as C.S. Lewis wrote in 1943. The defense of man is in this respect, not only a theoretical task, but also I think an ethical duty. This is an um, overview of the book, uh, which gives you perhaps an um, idea of what it is about and what, is main, what its main goals are. I have prepared a short um, sketch of the first chapter, which deals with artificial intelligence, which would be the next part. Um, but we can uh, make a break here and see um, how we can go on, how long we can go on, or if there are questions at this uh, point already. So as you like, Susie. Yes, I mean, if anyone in uh, the audience want to ask uh, a question, uh, absolutely, go ahead. You can type it in the chat box or you can just take the floor and ask your question. As you like, so if there is a question is fine, if not, then I can still go on. No problem. Just let us know. Yeah, yeah. Three, two, one. <laughs> Shall we continue? <laughs> All right, let's go on and then oh, we'll well. move on. Okay, let's go on. Do I have and still ten do I have still ten, fifteen minutes or so? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And okay. Meanwhile, if any of you wants to ask uh, a question, you can type it in the chat box and then we'll read everything later. We can also of course, do this. Okay, of course. All right. is, um, is everything understandable? Is it working technically, Susie? 
or are right. there any yeah. problems? Absolutely. Nope. Works Perfect. fine. Very well. Okay. Uh, that's chapter one, human and artificial intelligence. So um, with the advances in artificial intelligence, uh, we mortal humans seem to be falling further and further behind. So intelligent systems are beginning to uh, surpass the first achievements of human intelligence. In chess, in Go, in poker, humans no longer stand a chance against them. And planning, choosing, decision-making, even driving a car will be increasingly taken away from us. And the corresponding announcements of AI engineers and futurologists virtually outdo each other. The fact is that AI can go further than humans. It could be billions of times smarter than humans at this point. Machines will follow a path that mirrors the evolution of humans. Ultimately, however, self-aware, self-improving machines will evolve beyond humans' ability to control or even understand them. And Ray Kurzweil, um, uh, head of development at Google, has announced the singularity for 2045, the point in time when artificial intelligence uh, achieves an exponential progress towards a super intelligence. A new era begins. Well, such fantastic forecasts are regularly corrected. But anyway, uh, there is almost no more human ability that is not attributed to artificial systems. Increasingly, uh, perceiving, recognizing, thinking, reasoning, or evaluating, or deciding are thought to be uh, possible for computers or AI systems. And conversely, human consciousness appears today to many only as a sum of algorithms a complex data structure in the brain, which in principle could be realized by electronic systems. We consider ourselves more and more like our machines. And conversely, we attribute more and more human characteristics to our machines. So what is the difference between human and artificial intelligence? And in this chapter, I develop an embodied concept of the human person in order to show that it is living processes in an organism on which our experience is ultimately based. In short, without life, there is no consciousness. And non-living technical systems can therefore never attain consciousness and thus they also lack the decisive prerequisite of human intelligence. And I developed this uh, concept uh, in three steps. I give a short look at subjectivity and its simulation. And then I uh, argue that persons are not programs and conversely that programs are never persons or can never become persons. So the, an idea of the future problems that subjectivity and its stimulation could pose is given by Sophia uh, Robert from the company Hanson Robotics, which is uh, currently in the media worldwide. And Sophia has a human-like facial expression modeled after Audrey Hepburn, shows various emotional expressions, a modulated voice, makes eye contact with others, and answers relatively complex questions. Of course, all this is just a bluff. Sophia doesn't understand anything of what she is asked. Nevertheless, her effect is stunning. So when will a future Sophia be indistinguishable from a charming, intelligent woman? This threshold is crossed in Her, that's the name of a science fiction film by Spike Jones. And here, Theodore, uh, a shy but sensitive man, shown here, 
Falsy loved the software program named Samantha with an erotic voice um, spoken by Scarlett Johansson. And a, uh, this is a program which is a learning program apparently develops human sensations. And the more Theodore falls in love with her, the more indifferent he becomes as to whether it is a real counterpart or just a simulation. The happy fit is enough for him. However, the love between man and program ultimately fails because of the further development of Samantha who make virtual contact with thousands of other people and operating systems, falling in love with them. And finally, she leaves Theodore. Well, as Sophia, Alexa, Siri or Samantha show, it is quite possible that we perceive robots and computer systems empathically. Obviously, we are all too inclined to project our own experience onto the simulations in a kind of digital animism. So how long does our resistance to simulation last and can be maintained? How great is its attraction? When do we give up the distinction between simulation and original? And in the end, will we be satisfied with the perfect simulation, the appearance of the other? These are likely to be crucial questions in a digitally automated culture, and they are currently completely open. What I would like to offer are two clarifications to distinguish and thus to defend the human being. Persons are not programs and programs are not persons. To start with the first, the common philosophy of cognitive science as well as artificial intelligence is functionalism. According to it, mental states, feelings, perceptions, thoughts, beliefs, consist only of regular links between inputs and outputs of a system. For example, someone who pricks his finger has a mental state of pain, that leads to the distorted facial mus muscles, moaning and withdrawal of the finger. Then pain is nothing more than the brain state that results in this associated output. And the brain state itself can be described as a certain amount of data. So pain is then nothing more than this state. And the mind in, in general, according to Steven Pinker, is a neural computer equipped by natural selection with combinatorial algorithms for causal and probabilistic reasoning. Is that true? Well, the decisive characteristic of pain, of feelings, of thoughts, is obviously lost in this functionalist conception, namely that they are being experienced. And with his well-known thought, uh, thought experiment of the Chinese room, Chun Tzu had already shown that meaning and significance cannot be traced back to functional algorithms if there is no subject who understands their meaning. You know this uh, thought experiment probably, but uh, let's repeat it. Um, imagine that a man who doesn't speak a word of Chinese is locked in a room containing only a manual with all the rules for answering Chinese symbols. Now the man receives uh, Chinese symbols from the outside through a slot in the room, that is the input. And he doesn't understand any of these symbols, but with the help of the program, he finds the appropriate answers, which he then gives outside the output. Now let us assume that the program is so good and the answers are so accurate that even the Chinese people outside wouldn't notice the deception. Nevertheless, one could certainly say neither of the man in the room nor of the system as a whole, he or it understands any word of Chinese. 
Well, this is, of course, an illustration of a computer in which a central processor operates according to algorithms. The machine and the machine, the computer functions perfectly, and yet it lacks the crucial prerequisite for understanding, namely consciousness. Understanding is more than an algorithm. But the same is true for the already mentioned example of pain, or for the taste of chocolate, or the smell of lavender. No qualitative experience can be derived from data and, and information. Consciousness is not at all the mindless passing through data states. It is always qualitative and it is always self-conscious. It is for me to feel pain, to perceive, to understand or to think. Nobody knows exactly how this self-consciousness is produced by the organism, but certainly not by mere programs, because such programs and carrier systems do not experience anything. Programs and uh, carrier systems can only give an output that is at best the simulation of experience, not the original. And uh, the assumption that the brain is a kind of computer with memories and computational units which processes inputs into outputs like the PC at home is a common misconception. I cannot um, refute this in more detail. Let's only say, um, uh, point out that in the brain, unlike in a computer, there is no distinction between hardware from software because every brain activity also changes already the structure, the synaptic connection, and the synaptic connection. There's also no data storage in the brain, but only variable reaction patterns, which are never exactly reactivated in the same form. So unlike as in a computer, the same thing never happens twice in the brain. And uh, moreover, neural signal transmission can be not be expressed in uh, zeros and ones, since it is constantly influenced by neuromodulators, which are indispensable above for the experience of emotions. All this makes already clear that the brain, that the brain is not a biological computer, but even more important is that the brain cannot fulfill its functions on its own. It is an organ of the living being with, a, with which it is closely interconnected. Consciousness results not from the cortex activity, but from the vital regulatory processes involving the whole organism, which are integrated already at the level of the brainstem and the diencephalon. From this, a bodily self-experience or the feeling of being alive arises, which underlies all mental, all higher mental functions. And we can also express it this way, all experiencing is a form of life. Without life, there is no consciousness and also no thinking. So even a perfect computer simulation of the brain would not be conscious any more than a perfect computer simulation of a hurricane would make us wet or blow us over. Conscious experience presupposes embodiment and thus biological processes in a living body. Persons are living beings, not programs. Now let's go the other way around. Why are programs never persons? Let us start with the term artificial intelligence itself. What do we mean by it? The Latin intelligere means to see, to understand, to grasp. So someone who is intelligent has at least a basic understanding of what he is doing and what is going on around him. He can see himself and his situation from a higher perspective. To do this, Intelligence impl implies self-consciousness, reflexivity. Now we have already seen that a computer system doesn't understand the slightest thing about what it does. 
and it's even more incapable and it is even more incapable of referring to itself of seeing itself from the outside so therefore it cannot be called intelligent it can only simulate intelligence and ai can be described generally as allowing a machine to behave in such a way that it would that it would be called intelligent if a human being behaved in such a way this is a definition given already by john mccarthy one of the um, one of the first uh, proponents of artificial intelligence in 1956 in short the notion of a dis disembodied intelligence without life and consciousness is self-contradictory it is only a simulation of a narrowly defined areas of human intelligence. Now, numerous objections might arise uh, pointing to the advanced cap capabilities of intelligent programs. But we can also always say that uh, these uh, uh, capabilities are not really present. Computers do not solve problems, for example, because problems do not arise for them at all. To be confronted with a problem and to cope with it is bound to a conscious experience. Obstacles, tasks only arise for goal-oriented beings that seek a way out from the present to a future that they anticipate. For the same reason, computers do not make decisions. Deciding presupposes the awareness of alternative, alternative possibilities, which are anticipated in, to, in the imagination. So I could do this or I could do that. But a computer has no sense for either. And there are also no goal seeking or target seeking systems. An intelligent bomb does not search for anything because it has no intentional relation to its, to its target object. It is not ahead of itself. So only for the engineer or for the shooter, the bomb has a, ta has a target, a goal. The performance of computer systems therefore has nothing to do with real human intelligence. Now, in the meantime, we are dealing with a new generation of AI, of course, namely so-called learning systems, which uh, with progressive adaptation through training uh, are able to um, identify different, uh, to identify certain patterns and to recognize, as it is called, a face or distinguish dogs from cats, to identify voices and so on. All this is certainly a remarkable progress, but can we really speak uh, of recognizing and learning here? Of course, a system doesn't recognize anything because the real experience of recognition, of familiarity and similarity is completely missing. To give an example, a certain learning system was able to identify cows in the most different positions and sections and different pictures. But when finally presented with a cow in front of a sea beach, the system mistook the cow for a ship. Because until then, it had only processed images of cows in meadows and fields. Without this context, the system went astray. But this means, despite a hundred thousands of image runs, it had not recognized a single cow before. Every small child would have seen the cow on the beach as a cow immediately, and that only after a few contacts with cows. So as it becomes obvious, the shape and the concept of a cow cannot be reduced to statistical probabilities of pixel matches. Therefore, one cannot speak of learning systems, but should better speak of adaptive systems. No AI system recognizes anything, and only living beings can learn. So 
In short, we have been all too hasty in granting the concept of intelligence to our machines. The term artificial intelligence can probably no longer be erased, but we should always remain aware of the fact that there is a fundamental difference between the computational capacities of a computer system and the perceptions, insights, and understanding of a human being. A summary. Intelligence in the true sense is tied to insight, overview, and self-awareness, understanding what one is doing. And the prerequisite for consciousness is not only a brain, but a living organism. All experiencing is based on life. Therefore, the concept of an unconscious intelligence is a wooden iron. What appears as intelligent about the performances of AI systems is only a projection of our own intelligent abilities. However, the, the fact that we are dealing in AI only with an externalization of our own calculation and thinking ability, and thus with a projection of ourselves, seems to get increasingly lost to us. Our anthropomorphism tempts us all too easily to ascribe human intentions, actions, and even feelings to our machines. And the greatest danger resulting from this is probably that we voluntarily leave more and more decisions to these systems, systems which are only transparent to a few and which elude democratic control. But all artificial systems remain finally dependent on our own conscious and purposeful execution of life. Our supposed artificial doubles are and will remain our own products and their intelligence is only the projection of our own. The decisive challenge of artificial, artificial intelligence lies in the question that it poses to us and to our self-image. Is our humanity exhausted in what can be translated into simulation, algorithms, and technology? Precisely because technology exceeds our special ab abilities, it, it challenges us to rediscover what our humanity actually consists of, namely not in information or data, but in a living, feeling, and embodied mind. Thank you for your attention. The book once Thank you so again much. at the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thomas, for this great presentation and uh, yeah, the problems that rightly it phrased. Uh, we already have one question. Um, I can read it aloud uh, and then we answer. I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce your name, I, I'm sorry. But the question is, uh, could you please explain how exactly do you think embodiment is uh, a bulwark against a reductive naturalism? What's stopping reductionists from explaining embodiment in purely scientific terms? Okay. okay. Yes, I think um, we have to conceive uh, embodiment in, um, in a particular way. Uh, so there are many concepts of embodiment underway uh, currently, and uh, it is not always easy to see what is the decisive difference between different concepts um, and which are uh, compatible with a reductionist naturalism on the one hand, and which are not. And of course, I would defend a concept of the embodiment which is not uh, compatible with reductionism. And for this, one needs a concept of the living being as an autopoetic system, um, which uh, determines uh, its parts in a certain way through downward uh, causation, top-down influence, so the whole influences the parts in a way that cannot be um, 
described and explained through the uh, processes on the micro level. So we need a concept of embodiment, uh, which includes a concept of emergence. So higher level uh, causation, higher level effectiveness, um, which um, enables the autopoetic organism, the autopoetic living being to reproduce itself um, through metabolism, something which uh, machines and robots can never do. So there are no living systems. And this concept of embodiment also, or this concept of autopoetic embodiment also creates the, um, the basis for consciousness. As I've briefly sketched out, consciousness as the result of an homeostatic uh, self-reproduction of the living being. So consciousness as the result of the regulation of the inner milieu of the organism. So um, this autopoetic self-maintenance uh, self -maintenance of the living being is something that cannot be explained on the level of physics. And this is a notion of the organism that we obviously need in order not to fall prey to uh, a new uh, reductionism, which includes embodiment in some kind of extended functionalism or extended um, materialism of consciousness. So uh, I cannot explain this in more detail here, of course, and I have to refer to uh, a number of or many works in this direction by um, um, Thompson, for example, Varela himself, of course, Ezekiel Di Paolo and others who have, who have uh, elaborated uh, on this uh, non-reductionist concept of embodiment. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we have time for one more question. Would be a pity to let it go like this. <laughs> it's fine. Francesca. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you Hi. for your presentation. Hi, thank you for your presentation, Thomas. Really Welcome. appreciate it. I had the joy to read the book, so I am into the topic very yeah, much. Yeah, you you know already <laughs> most of it, I guess. But anyway, sometimes uh, there there is a, a concept to which is to me particularly important to stress. I'm referring to the third section of the book, a psychiatry and a society when you explore the possibility to have a different approach to medicine, and you argue that a relational medicine could be the, a key to understand on one hand, why it's important to remark the critics toward the, the neuroscientific approach to subjectivity, to consciousness. And on the other hand, how experiences cannot be reduced only to this uh, cerebrocentrism. And uh, I would like to ask you if you can say some more words about the notion of relational medicine, mm -hmm. this integrative concept, because I think it can be of interest both for people coming from philosophy, but also from people coming from cognitive sciences as well as medicine. Yes, thank you. Um, give me, gives me the... Uh opportunity to, uh, to, to the, uh, the occasion to uh, say a few words on, uh, well, the application of the uh, embodied embodiment concept to psychiatry, which is, of course, uh, particularly important for me and my work. Um, the concept of embodiment, as I described, as I uh, um, elaborated, uh, of course, sees the exchange of uh, the living body with the environment as crucial for its uh, maintenance, as I just pointed out. And this exchange happens on many levels. So an autopoietic system is only um, uh, viable. It can only survive. It can only live when it is in constant exchange with the environment. And in that respect, uh, in that sense, it is always relational. 
and also the brain uh, as a special part of this uh, living self-sustaining uh, being is only uh, working in, uh, in the context of uh, relations of sensory motor and inner organismic regulatory uh, cycles. So we need, in order to um, understand embodiment, always the exchange over, so across the border, so to speak. So there are some semi-permeable membranes and across these borders, uh, exchange is always, uh, all the time uh, um, uh, in progress uh, going on. And this exchange is the same in our social environment. Um, so we are never isolated monads, but uh, our consciousness, even our self-consciousness, and our whole perception always implies the others. The others are always somehow uh, uh, witnesses, and they are inner uh, witnesses of all that we execute in our lives. All our uh, actions, all our interactions are basically uh, embedded in the social life with others. If that is the case, then also mental illness, mental disorders cannot be described and understood as uh, monadic uh, disorders in, individu in individual brains, but they are disorders of, um, of uh, relationships, uh, disorders of interacting with others. Um, in, the, in the wider sense, there are all kinds of social, social psychological disorders, although they of course include the brain and also brain dysfunctions, but these dysfunctions only become dysfunctions within the relationships that a person has with his or her environment, uh, social environment. If that is the case, then psychiatry has to um, become an ecological psychiatry, uh, which includes a few of, the, of organisms in their environment and of persons in their social environments uh, into its uh, uh, holistic concept into its fundamental concept of what mental disorders are. So uh, mental disorders are always disorders of a person's world, of a person's being in the world. This changes, of course, the, the, um, the, the main uh, attention, the, the main focus uh, of psychiatry, because the main focus is no longer on special areas of the brain, but on the cycles, the interactive cycles in which the person and its and her brain is embedded, is involved. And these cycles are cycles that we can change, that we can modify, that we can influence through our interactions, through our embodied uh, therapies, through psychotherapy, through social therapy, through changing the ecological environment and influencing the ecological environment of persons. And uh, here you see that the concept, which is very fundamentally based on the, on the, on the living being as an exchanging, uh, self-sustaining being in uh, constant interaction with the environment, also uh, becomes um, important on the highest level of human interaction and human, well, also of human illness, of course. And um, the same principles apply uh, to psychiatry, even on, as a social psychiatry, as a relational medicine, then uh, apply on the basic level. This is just a short, um, well, prospect on, <laughs> on such a concept, which has to be developed in much more detail, of course. Well, thank you so much for adding this uh, last bit, uh, which, yeah, it opens to another uh, big scenario. Uh, thank you all for joining today. Thank you for uh, this great presentation and uh, we look forward to reading the full book. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. I, I wish you a wonderful day for uh, evening for those in Europe, a day evening. for those. <laughs> yes. A wonderful day for those in California 
And um, I want to add that um, if you have special questions, um, I hope it's not too many in the group. And you said it's a rather small group, so it's no problem. If you have special questions, you can write me an email. It's no, uh, no problem. I would try to give a, a, an answer to your additional questions if they come up later on. So you're welcome to do so. Okay. Thanks for the generosity. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank